Uh, it's Clary Starling, ma'am. I had a message it's you were... Catherine. Catherine? Hello? Catherine? I didn't know how else to get you to call me back. I've been calling you. Is it you can't look at me? Because I remind you of him. Precious? Is that Precious? I saw you on the news yesterday talking about dead women. Help me. Yeah, I saw it. The way he talked. Now it's the in the back. That strangled voice when he... I heard his voice, Captain. Can you sleep? Or do moths wake you up? How are you out there in the world? We're different people. No, we're exactly the same. You think you can rewrite the story, but you can't. My mother can't trust anything she says. There's no one for you. Just me. Precious is out of pee pads. Can you get some? You can take her out. Not far. Not for a walk. Just outside. Just outside. Just get more pee pads, please. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. Forget it. Look, if I, if I'll just I keep her just in my try. room. Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live, and it is my pleasure tonight to welcome our very special guest, Marnie Carpenter, who plays Catherine <laughs> on the new CBS hit show, Clarice. Marnie, thank you so much for being here with us. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, it is our pleasure, our pleasure. So let's just start. How did this come your way? How did the, the role of Catherine made infamous in Silence of the Lambs come your way? Well, I am very lucky to have a very dedicated and hungry manager that got me in the room for this audition. And he knows that Silence of the Lambs has been my favorite movie my entire life since seeing it. And when the audition came through, I was the most nervous I have ever been and the most excited I've ever been for an audition. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Now... At which point in the casting process was Catherine, were you cast? Did they already have uh, their Clarice? They, I found that out after the fact, but yes, I, I believe they were moments away from picking their Clarice, Rebecca Breeds at the time. Um, so I, I wasn't aware of it. I was actually in a separate kind of, audition from everyone else um, as they were testing and going through all of this. So I I wasn't privy to any of that. And I auditioned uh, for April Webster and I found out a week later and we are actually exactly a year away on the day today that I found out that I booked it. Oh, wow. That is so amazing. <laughs> now you're a big Silence of the Lambs fan. Um, mm -hmm. Clarice has an amazing cast, okay? When did you actually find out who your co-stars were going to be? Like Michael Cudlitz, Cal Penn, uh, Rebecca Breeds. We're going to get to Rebecca in a while, but when did you find sure. out the ensemble? It kind of trickled in as we were talking to each other. Initially, we were supposed to start shooting um, in March of last year. And obviously the world shut down, certainly for the States in March of last year. Yeah. So we thought we were shooting and then everyone kind of got turned around. I hadn't traveled yet, but I know that some folks had to turn around. Um, so once that all kind of happened, we realized that we would only be able to communicate like we are now yeah. um, on Zoom and all of those kinds of things. So we all touched base because we didn't have the luxury of beginning. So we actually got to know each other online first. That is really amazing. Michael Cudlitz was a guest on our show back at the end of May. And at that point, when I was when I had him on this show, it was just a little blurb on his IMDb. He's in an upcoming show called Clarice. I'm mm -hmm. like, I asked him about it. But to see Michael uh, 
play the role of Paul Krendler, to see Rebecca, play Clarice, to see yourself, bring Catherine back to life. Was there, uh, and particularly for you, pressure in uh, reviving the role of Catherine? I see it as an honor and a really neat challenge. Um, I don't, it's going to be what we make these characters continuing them forward. So I don't see it as pressure. It's more just an opportunity to expand these stories that didn't really exist to the length that we're going to take them now. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that we continue to honor the story and just perpetuate it further, especially for, for Catherine's sake, for my character, there really wasn't much of her story beyond literally being trapped in a pit. Yeah. So I like that we're able to just see more of her world and move on. Absolutely. Now, uh, after Silence of the Lambs, there was a sequel, Hannibal. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, you're my first guest from Clarice, so you get the, this lucky question. Uh, we mm -hmm. as viewers are we this is the the show takes place a year after the silence uh, events so we as viewers mm -hmm. are to assume that either a the sequel Hannibal has those sequence of events have yet to occur or are we to assume to disregard the Hannibal movie sequel and this is what happened after silence of the lambs uh, yeah, we're very separate from the Hannibal storyline, to be honest. Yeah, um, in fact, you're not so allowed to use the name. Yes, we, based on rights, we can't use the actual name in the show. We can reference, but we can't actually mm -hmm. say the name Hannibal in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, I can right now. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say it in the show. So it's a very separate storyline. And I know people are huge fans of that show. And we actually have crew that worked as part of that show, too. So I, I like that we're kind of including people from that world, since I know there are a lot of diehard fans. Um and I know Matt Mickelson gave a wonderful performance. I did not see the entire show. I'm sorry. Don't come after me. Um, but I know that it's um, that there's just a huge, almost cult following for that show in and of itself. Um, I think Clarice is truly exactly what it sounds like. We're continuing her story. We're not focusing on Hannibal. Um, so we're just doing a different story. Yeah. And hopefully people will give us a shot, too. Absolutely. And so far, four episodes in, everybody's hooked. I'll tell you that much. And oh, I've, good. I've had Carolyn Davernas, who played Alana Bloom on Hannibal. And uh, to be honest with you, Marnie, I did not, I was a huge Hannibal fan, the TV show. I did not mm -hmm. really appreciate the scope of the fandom until I announced that Carolyn is going to, was going to, is going to be on my show. They are such diehards out there. And it's funny because I went to Carolyn. Hannibal could not continue because they could not get the Clarice name rights. Clarice cannot get the Hannibal rights. I'm like, if only you guys got together. Wow. Talk about mm. an amazing mix that would come together. Now, let's move on to you uh, have only had interaction with Jane Atkinson who plays your mom, who is an amazing actress. Uh, first off, yes, what, are, what are your thoughts on working with Jane? I love working with Jane. We, we have a really good rapport. I have to say our relationship is nothing like what it is on screen, thankfully. Um, we, we really like to hang between takes and have a laugh with each other. So as much as there seems to be a lot of fire there when, when we get to take a break, um, it's it's really fun. Um, we have quite a laugh together. And handling Precious, we have a whole, whole deal with that too. Um, I have since gotten to work with many of the other actors that are on our show, but I know you guys haven't seen that no, yet, so no. I'm not gonna let any cats or Preciouses out of the bag. <laughs> That's right, we're not quite there yet, and I'm looking forward to you yeah. getting there. Uh, mm -hmm. what do you think of the idea that they, uh, they brought Precious back, the dog? Is it uh, just a big part of Catherine's PTSD? 
I would argue that it helps her with her PTSD, to be honest. Um, I think <clears throat> that Catherine views animals uh, a lot of the way that I view animals. I do a lot of work with dogs myself. And I think that for her, it was kind of like Precious didn't choose her owner. And this dog now no longer has a family, so I'll be her family. So even though it is a total, for a lot of people, an oddball choice, it makes sense to me. It makes sense that she kept the dog. And in Thomas Harris's novel, um, we didn't really see this in the film, but in the novel, we are led to believe that Precious gets sent to the animal shelter and that Catherine convinces Ruth, her mother, to go scoop up the dog and adopt the dog. Wow. So I like that we continued that bit of the story and that Precious is still with us. I do. I love that fact as well. I love that Precious is back. And that little clip that I played in the beginning where mm -hmm. Rebecca Clarice asks Catherine, is that Precious? Uh, mm -hmm. And then in that same sequence, you actually ask Clarice if it's real because uh, it was so traumatic for you. You said that you don't, you have days where you don't believe if it actually happened or not. Uh, for me, mm -hmm. when I heard that, I'm like, Precious is Catherine's reminder of what she went through. That's how I rationalized mm -hmm. it. But I like your explanation much better. <laughs> uh, so, as of right now, you and Rebecca have only had interaction that one time through the phone, and it was mm -hmm. electric. It was electric. You two like set each other off. Uh, mm. How is it like working with Rebecca? Who? Well, first of all, do you know? And I've asked this question to my viewership: casting Clarice. Mm -hmm must have been really difficult. It was an Emmy, oh, sorry, an Oscar nominated role. Jodie Foster mm -hmm. did an amazing job as Clarice. Absolutely. I can imagine how hard the casting department and how long it must have taken them to cast Clarice. Do you know how long it, the process took? I actually, I don't know when they began. I, I know that they, of course, took it very seriously. And it was never like, we know exactly who she is. They, they didn't. Um, they definitely went through a number of people and um, eventually decided on Rebecca. And side tidbit, I know that they called her and said, Hello, Clarice, on the phone to her <laughs> when a... she booked it. <laughs> so I thought that was really sweet and crafty and lovely. Um, but I I know that both Alex and Jenny, who created the show, um, in many of the interviews that we've had together, they've felt that she, more than anything, just really honored the role, and I think that's what they were looking for more than anything, um, was just someone that really embodied this character that Jenny really identified with and really just loved deeply, which is a big reason they got the rights to do this show was because of how much Jenny truly identified with and loved and had an ex encyclopedia knowledge of Clarice, this character. Um, so for them, I know that they felt that she was the heart of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's what sold them. Now, when you were getting prepared to play Catherine, mm -hmm. did you uh, meet or talk to Brooke Smith, who is the original Catherine? To just, I, don't I, know. I have not had the pleasure of speaking with her. Okay, okay. I was always curious about that. I wonder if any of these characters reached out to any of the original characters. And... Uh, it's good to, it, it's so we know that you did not reach out to uh Catherine. yeah how was it i feel like there's with with actors i feel like there's a bit of a respect with that of like she she did an incredible amazing job i personally would have been it's almost like crossing that creative line yeah i, I feel like that film is its own amazing feat mm -hmm. and that's hers and she gets to have that forever and that, so i would never want to infiltrate that in any way yeah and not only that that catherine that uh while she was kidnapped and before she was kidnapped is long gone mm -hmm. it's not the same catherine anymore you know that catherine is mm -hmm. long gone so walk us through the flashback scenes 
okay? When you're actually put in that, well, I don't know if it was filmed in a pit, but you dress up like Catherine was in the movies. How did it feel for you being a fan of the movie to re be recreating parts of the movie in the, in the TV show? Yeah, I, I definitely wasn't going at it from the mindset of this needs to look exactly the same. That's kind of everybody else's job in mm -hmm. terms of the aesthetics. And I think our director for our pilot, uh, Maya, did an amazing mm -hmm. job really matching the aesthetic both for Buffalo Bill's basement and uh, for the pit itself. Exactly. I being in it was definitely surreal because I am sealed in it. It is, you know, closed from the side. I have no cameras in the pit with wow. me. I am in it. So um, it's, it's definitely surreal. And I truly just worked off of the fear of it um, and what anxieties that digs up and what that helplessness can look like. So it wasn't about matching Brooke Smith or the film for me. It was, how do I speak to the truth of this? In preparation for portraying PTSD, did you like uh, do anything special, like maybe attend meetings for people who did, are going through PTSD? What kind of preparation did you do to portray someone who's dealing with some really traumatic uh, PTSD? Um, I tried to really work off of the symptoms that are written into our scripts and what the writers have chosen as her symptoms. Um, and while I couldn't attend and meeting, certainly not in person, I, I did a lot of research online and even spoke to friends of mine that um, deal with different forms of anxiety, um, panic attacks, things like that. Um, the more real experience I can have talking with someone and at feeling comfortable asking questions of someone that is suffering from that, the safer I feel in asking it. Mm -hmm. So I would feel a bit stranger about asking someone that I didn't know. Um, I want to be really careful to respect people's privacy with those kinds of things. Yes. So for me, it's going to be a lot of online research and reading and talking to people that I know uh, more than reaching out to someone that I don't know. Yeah. So how do you feel with how they wrote Catherine a year after the events? She is a xenophobe. She's a shut in. Uh, is that I mean, that mm -hmm. is correct. She are we to assume that Catherine, she's agoraphobic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. She's agoraphobic. She's suffering from anorexia. Um, yeah. So she after she was obviously taken to the hospital and brought home with her mom, Ruth, we are to assume she has just not left the house at all. She has not. That's yeah. correct. And uh, the pee pads for uh, Precious tells it all. Uh, you know, you don't even take Precious out for walks. You know, Precious has to do right. her business right there. Uh, I like that. I really like how they took Catherine's path. And, and just like I told you before we went live, I love the fact that they brought back to Catherine, the, sorry, the character of Catherine. They could have very easily went on with Clarice and left Catherine sure. out, you know? Even brought Ruth back, the mom, Jane Atkinson, and yep. have Catherine just be mentioned every now and again. But Catherine's character, up until the four episodes that we have seen so far, uh, what we have seen so far, Catherine is what's driving Ruth. It's, uh, it's we are left to assume that's why uh, Jane Atkinson, Ruth, became the attorney general, is to prevent what happened to her daughter to other girls. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think her daughter is a very big drive for her. I think a, a lot of it is coming from feeling like anything to help, even if it means helping someone else. If she wasn't helpful enough in the moment, you see the mother in the in the film um struggling to find ways to solve it and make it better and obviously we see her missteps as well um as part of that so i think it's how do i make up for my errors in a lot of ways um 
and I love now seeing what they've written for Ruth and what Jane is doing to tackle the role. It's it's really wonderful and honest. Yeah. How many episodes are we getting in the first season? In the first season, am I allowed to say this? I don't know. Uh, We're listed at... Uh, I, 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 I don't know if this is one of those secret questions or not, but I don't know if it is. It I a... don't know either. <laughs> okay, so we're listed at 10. I'm just going to say it. There's 13. 13. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I, don't, I don't tell anyone. We're not no, on the okay. internet or anything, right? <laughs> 13 is great. Or it's great. I know we're four into it. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, I hope it's not like only six. And then we only have two no, episodes no, we left and we have yeah. to wait a whole year. Um this is another question that I don't want to put you on the spot. I want you to look at it from an outside perspective without revealing okay. anything that you can't reveal. Sure. What no, do you I'm think? I'm definitely not one for spoilers. So what I'll would you it. think right now would take for Catherine to leave the house? Obviously she is nowhere close to leaving the house on her own. Not even close. She's not attending any kind of therapy at least that we know of, it would, to me, I see it as something is going to have to force her out, meaning something dramatic is going to have to happen in her house. As if you can sort of remove yourself, not give any spoilers, sure. what would you think would drive her out of her house? Uh, for me, just, I can go off of just reading her character description um, before I ever got to play any of the episodes. Um, just reading how they how they saw her, they wrote Catherine as a truth teller. Yeah. And I think we can clearly see from the film, she's a fighter. Like she does not, I think a big reason she's still with us is because she is as strong and resilient as she is. I truly don't think she'd be here otherwise. Um, so I think for, for her, it is about the truth and fighting for her life, quite literally. Okay, that totally makes sense. What do you think makes Catherine feel like Clarice is the only one who can help her? She's the only one that's been there. Even though she was not ever, you know, a hostage, she's the one that rescued yeah. Catherine. Just because she yeah, saw she, she saw the, the place, the surroundings where she was kept. Yeah, I think, too, she was still hunted by this person. Even though she wasn't abducted, she was still stalked and hunted by Buffalo Bill. Buffalo so Bill, yeah. I think it's it's the only it's the only person that's still living that has any idea mm -hmm. of what that feels like. Um, and there's a lot missing from the film in terms of what happened to Catherine in that basement. I mean, obviously books tend to give us a lot more than mm -hmm. films have time to do. Um, a lot has happened to her and for Clarice to just even experience an ounce of it, it's the only person that's ever really going to get it. And you are both suffering from PTSD, but are dealing mm -hmm. with it uh, similarly in that you are both avoiding it, actually getting help for it, at least Catherine is trying to reach out to the one person she thinks can help her. Uh, Clarice is just completely doesn't want to think about it. You know, her way of dealing mm -hmm. with the PTSD is to try to pretend it never happened. What are your thoughts on the two different ways on how your characters are both dealing with your trauma? Yeah, I think it's important that we see both sides of it and where these two characters meet in the middle of it all as well. I think that despite Catherine not having direct help, certainly not medically, um, mm -hmm. at this point that we're, we are seeing someone who is living in it and facing it that way. I think yeah. that she is really honest in this is where I'm at even if she's not getting direct help yet. Yeah. I think she is very take me or leave me. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm dealing with. This is what my life looks like right now. Um, whereas for Clarice, we see this high functioning yet crumbling at the same time individual. So I think it's important that 
mental health gets talked about mm-hmm. a lot with this mm-hmm. um, and where there are faults with kind of the two extremes and where there can be help in the two extremes as well. I think that's going to play out over the season and hopefully people will get to have a discussion about it. And I love that fact. I love the fact that mental health is being addressed. It's showing how Mm -hmm. people who have suffered trauma can deal with it in two separate ways. And Mm -hmm. even though, like you said, Clarice is functioning internally and she slipped, uh, it's coming out when she smashed that mug, you know, towards the wall. She, it's like a boiling pot. It's just starting to boil over and she's going to crack. Uh, was yep. it emotionally and physically draining to film that scene where you're doing that leg pull-ups and hanging upside down the workout? Uh, I mean, was that was that you first of all, or was that a double? Um, it was both me and a double. Uh, I actually the part I did one on my own. There's a lot of insurance reasons why I'm not allowed to do okay. the rest of them. Um, but uh, there's also a shot that the, that we used with a camera where I pretty much don't have any use of my abdomen uh, because I had two harnesses on. I had a harness for um, the rig to the ceiling and a harness for the camera arm that was attached to me. So I had a camera that extended out about two feet or so from my body mm-hmm. and it lit I had to lift the camera with me so I really had no use of my own strength um, to get those shots where my face is quite close up um, so that was fun and something I have not done before <laughs> um, so yeah pretty exhausting but at the same time I'm trying to match the physical exhaustion that would happen in that instance while I'm pretty much strapped into a device the whole time. <laughs> So as we proceed on to the remaining uh, nine episodes, let's say, is Mm -hmm. Catherine's present role going to increase? Can you tell us at least that much? Are we going to start to see a lot more of you? We're going to see more of her, and thankfully me. So, yes. We will, we will get to enjoy a little bit more towards uh, the second half. Okay, yeah. okay, that's good to know. Now, for me, mm-hmm. Clarice, uh, a lot, a lot of people started watching Clarice because it's a continuation of Silence of the Lambs. I, I'm one of them, but uh, it could totally be a non-related show to Silence of the Lambs. It's a great mm-hmm. show on its own. What do you attribute mm-hmm. that to? Just a show on its own merit so far. I know we're only four episodes in, uh, but it's a mm-hmm. great show f- right now for me, regardless of Silence of the Lambs. Mm. What would you pinpoint? That's nice. I like hearing that. <laughs> what would you pinpoint I... being the major factor? Oof. I mean, it always boils down to love, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, I I think the love from this project comes from every single possible angle, especially that we are shooting in a pandemic and we are still shooting at this caliber and a pandemic speaks volumes. Um, I'm not even slightly shy about it because that's all of the other people that make this happen. Mm -hmm. Um, From our writer's room to our original creators and producers down to the PA that makes me feel like a human being in the morning. I mean, I, everyone is there because they love their job so much and they, they just care about it. So I think when you get a group of actors together that clearly cares the way I know you all have met Michael um, on this show, he is wonderful. Like everyone is at his level of loving their role and the writing in that same way. It's just, we, none of us want to do anything else. This is it. Um, We're just so thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to shoot during a pandemic is such a gift. Mm -hmm. So I think if everybody in the machine cares that much, the product's going to be hopefully beautiful. And I think people are seeing that now. So I'm to hear you say that it stands on its own, even without the silence of the lambs. Absolutely. I think, I think we're doing our job, hopefully. Doing our jo- and you know, I, I would put it on two things, the writing and the acting. Uh, mm. 
the acting is fabulous. The writing is fabulous. The dynamic between Paul Krendler and uh, Clarice, two people who barely even cross paths in the movie. Mm. And uh, in that first episode, for those for all, everybody that watched the pilot, uh, we saw Michael Cudlitz and we're like, oh man, he's going to be a total, you know, a-hole through this. We're going to hate him. <laughs> he's going to be, you know, a, just an, a, a bad guy. We're not going to like him. And it only mm-hmm. took... And it shows how good Michael Cutlets, uh, how good of an actor he is. Within that next episode, we start warming up to him. And we start mm-hmm. learning more of what's the driving factor of uh, Paul Krendler. What are, I mean, do you look at people like Michael Cutlets, uh, who's been in this business for a long, long time, and mm-hmm. try to get like, you know, how does he do some things? try to pick up on, you know, learning from him and so on? Absolutely. Just watching the episodes as they've aired, I I haven't gotten, certainly with COVID restrictions, we don't have the same access to set that we mm-hmm. normally would if we're not working. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be fair, I've been really separate from a lot of the cast um, just because of the world that Catherine is living in. Yeah. Um, so when I do get to watch footage of everyone yeah i'm taking notes (laughs) i'm taking a lot of notes because i i love michael's acting i love rebecca's acting i love i could watch nick sandow all day and he knows it so if he's out there he knows it i think that we we're really blessed we've got an amazing group of people and the women on this show are just powerhouses i think Oh, it's yeah. it's magic to watch all these pieces fit together and our day players and our recurring characters i mean there is no one slacks in the slightest mm. everyone's coming in with a punch and i i love that i just love seeing people that love to do this and really put it to the camera yeah yeah going back to the the female powerhouses jane atkinson i've, t- I've said this so many times jane atkinson has done so much stuff and she almost 90% of the time plays some kind of high-ranking government official. Uh, yep. Who was it? I, I told him to relay a message to her to run for office. I'd vote for her because... Okay, <laughs> I don't know. Because when you see her, you see her as either head of the FBI or mm-hmm. running for president. It's just she fits that role so perfectly. Uh, yeah. So they had two options when writing Clarice. They could have taken it like the criminal minds where every episode is its own story. What do you think about the conspiracy, uh, really big backdrop story that's going on? The murders, the serial killer that they thought they grabbed in the first episode, just being a pawn. What are your thoughts Mm -hmm. on that storyline and how it's going? I think that's great. I love that it's not just a straight up procedural. I Mm -hmm. think this is a little more out of the box for CBS, which I think is really neat. Mm -hmm. Um, And I hope we can kind of bend the bars and make it something that's unique. Uh, So I love that there's this whole lengthy story that's happening that we're kind of all attached to from start to finish. And instead of it just being this, oh yeah, I could sit down and watch this episode and then throw it away. Like, nope. You <laughs> Did you pay attention? Tuned. Cause we're yeah. about to talk about it again. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I exactly. like that. You got to stay tuned. Are you guys done shooting all of season one filming it? We are not, we are still shooting. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, I thought you guys would be all done by now. Has CBS officially nope. renewed it for season two? No news yet. Fingers crossed, guys. It will. Trust me. Send in your emails. Trust me. <laughs> trust me. It will be. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you that it will be renewed. <laughs> so let's go back to your start. You are from Rhode Island. Uh, is that accurate? Right. What were, that is true. How... Uh, When did you know you wanted to be an actress? Eight years old. How did you get started in it? I started in theater. I auditioned for the regional theater Trinity Repertory uh, Company when I was eight years old for 
a Christmas Carol, which they do every year. Mm -hmm. And I, I got it. And I was playing the part of Scrooge's little sister and I had a cape and curls and <laughs> my mom did my hair every night for it. And I, I still remember running around the back of the entire theater behind all the audience chairs and waiting at the top of this big long staircase and no one knew I was there except for the people that were working on the show. And that split second of having something in my pocket that the audience didn't know, I was like, I want to, I want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> and no regrets, right? No regrets. What was it like the first time you went out to LA from Rhode Island going out to LA? I went to school first. I went to school in Miami. Uh, I did an undergrad there and I moved out pretty much straight, straight after I graduated. And I had never even been to LA. I was, I was pretty sure I didn't want to live in New York. Not that I don't love New York, but I just, it was really close to home for one. And then I, yeah, I just wanted something different. I had no intention of like, yeah, I'll definitely do film and television. It was definitely a long shot and a what if. Um, and I was definitely a little nervous, but went for it anyway. So would you say Clarice is your big break right now? As of right now, the biggest break? Yes. Yep. Has your Absolutely. life changed since the pilot aired like are you getting uh, calls from people you haven't heard from in decades <laughs> you're right that does happen <clears throat> yeah, you do get you do get messages and calls from people you haven't talked to in a while that's yeah, true yeah. um and anyone who knows me knows i'm i i don't suffer fools gladly so <laughs> i'm not gonna put up with anybody I don't want to talk to, um, <laughs> but I, I think for me, it's, it's, it's just the way that it's changed for me is just that sense of honestly pride. I hope that it never comes off as anything, but just proud to be able to do the thing that I love. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, that's the only thing that really shifted is internal of, you didn't do all of this for nothing. Like yeah. you worked your butt off and it. And you're, here you, here you, you know, go. you're in a business where rejection is so huge. I mean, yes. what were your feelings when you got the call, the call that you got the role? I mean, I know it's probably impossible to actually put it into words, mm -hmm. but if you were to describe it, to say, wow, I'm on CBS on the continuation TV show of Silence of the Lambs as Catherine. What were the feelings that you were experiencing? Um, I was driving, which was probably not a good choice in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> um, my agent, my manager got me on a group call as I was driving to acting class. Oh, boy. <laughs> so... Yeah, so that was pretty wild. And I'm always early for class. I was the class secretary forever for that class. <laughs> and I was always very, like, on it and early and, you know, did all the right things. And I had to text my teacher from the car and be like, I'm really sorry, I'm running late. So I ran... I, I, I ran in and I was, I didn't want to say it in front of anyone. And I like took him aside. I was like, I'm really sorry. I'm running late, but this happened. <laughs> and he lost it. And it was, yeah, it was, it I can was imagine great. just how proud they must've been, you know, for yeah. you that you got yeah. it. Um, what, what advice would you give somebody uh, who wants to be a, uh, an actor or actress and get the break that you got, would you say just never give up, you know, be ready for rejection? What would you say to them? Yeah. I, I think the first and foremost that nobody's path is ever the same as the next person. I think plenty of people will try to tell you this is how to go about it. This is how it's done. And I don't have that for anyone because 
any person I've talked to has a different through line and a different set of circumstances. So I, I don't have an answer. There's no trick. Um, so but I, yeah, go I, ahead. I would just, you know, from what I've heard and all the actors that I've talked to, every, mm -hmm. the, the idea seems to be just never give up. Yeah. If, if you love it and you know, you love it and you truly feel like I cannot do anything else. For me, those are the people that stick with me in terms of their stories um, because I identify with them. I truly felt like, yeah, I could do other things. I'm capable of doing other things. I can't imagine it. I can't fathom it. I didn't want anything else. And I knew that no matter how brutal the letdown got, it wasn't going to stop me. And anyone else that had the limiting beliefs weren't going to stop me. And I think that's the biggest one is do not listen to anybody else that thinks you should do something else. Uh, you know what, uh, what really sticks out to me in the conversation that I had with Michael Cudlitz, uh, mm -hmm. towards the end of our interview, I pointed out the fact that he was Shannon Doherty's date in 90210 back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he responded with like, yeah. And, the fact that he had pride because that was that small part is a big part to where he is now and he he the pride he showed in that really impressed uh -huh. me it impressed me you mm. know because no part is too small no part Absolutely. is too big it's all a step to achieving your dreams and living your dreams and i think that's yeah. one of the things that makes michael so special you know he's just that kind yeah. of a guy uh now yep. you own a, a dog rescue business what is that about um i do both a lot of volunteer work and i do um behavioral training for dogs as well so i tend to on the business side focus on dogs that may not benefit in the same way from an obedience class where the families just really need help in adjusting them and helping them out of either trauma or separation anxiety or socialization with other dogs, different hurdles that come up that don't really get addressed with the, the sit and stay aspect that happens in an obedience class. So that's why I made my business. But in LA, I've fostered over 30, maybe even over 40 dogs at this point that have been adopted since. Um, and I do a lot of drives. If you see a Jeep roaming around, there's probably a dog in the back that I'm taking to the vet. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I do a lot of rescue work in L.A. that I love. And you played an animal ha uh, handler in Yellowstone mm -hmm. in 2018. Yes. What was that experience mm -hmm. like? Oh, so fun. I worked with one of my best friend's dogs, actually, who is a rescue dog. Um, he was paralyzed and uses a cart when he um, goes out on, like, big hikes and walks. But in his everyday life. He pulls himself around just fine and, like, will scuttle around in the yard outside in the grass. Um, he has no idea that he has this disability. Um, he is a happy, happy dude. His name is Fast Eddie, and I really did have to hike him before we worked on his scene where he's supposed to be bedraggled and, like, pulling uh -huh. himself along after an explosion. And they were like, he looks too happy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we'll hike for like an hour and then I'll bring him back and we'll try again. So that's exactly what we had to do. We had to hike him and uh, bring him back. So he was just a little tuckered out for his big scene. He had his own trailer. It was very special. <laughs> that was so cute. I love that. Yeah. Here's another hypothetical question. Uh, sure. Criminal Minds went on for 15 years, another CBS show. And mm -hmm. some people were there from the beginning. If you would pick, would you say, yeah, I would love for Clarice to go on for eight or more years and have that job security playing Catherine? Or do you would prefer for it to be a good, successful run, however long it is, and have it be a real big stepping stone to your next project? Basically, what I'm asking is, you don't want to, you know, do you want to be pigeonholed as playing Catherine Martin for the next 10 years? Yeah, the short answer is no. I, do I hope that the show goes on and is as wonderfully successful as I think it should be? Yes, absolutely, 100%. 
Um, but I'm always going to want to just get my hands in something new and something different any chance I get to do that. So the more characters I get to play, the better. That's awesome. Now, before, we know you're a Sounds of the Lambs fan, but uh, would Mm -hmm. you say you were a horror fan in general? I have to leave that to my best friend, Rima. She's a huge horror fan. Uh, She's amazing. She could probably rattle off all of the titles you know so well and love. Um, I'm a wimp. (laughs) <laughs> the horror department. I really am. Um, I love a good suspenseful movie, but when it gets into like crazy gore and stuff like that, I, I'm just a wimp. No, I'm a wimp. No, no, don't, don't, don't be ashamed. <laughs> there are a lot of people who have done tons of horror that I've spoken to that don't necessarily. That's their number one genre on their Netflix queue. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm this one the whole time. <laughs> just like no nope. <laughs> i would classify clarice as a psychological drama what would you classify it as no i yeah i think that's spot on i i would call it a psychological like thriller or drama absolutely um yeah i i think a lot of it is about our and i think this ties to thomas harris is our perception of things, our assumptions about things and how in a lot of areas we're wrong about that. I love that we think we know what's going to happen and then something gets flipped the other direction. Uh, I and my mom will watch a ton of, you know, crime shows and the typical procedural and we're always saying, oh, this is going to happen. This is what's next. And we usually can guess it. I like not being able to guess it just reading scripts off of Clarice, it's it's awesome. It's me, my favorite part. Me too. You don't know how many times I sit on the couch and me and my wife are watching TV and I recite the next line. And I'm always right. And it's like, okay, that's predictable. Does writing. she put up with that or does she kick you off the couch? No, she does it too. <laughs> so when she knows what's coming, she does it too. Yeah. When I know what's coming, I do it as well. Now, yeah. uh, this show takes place in the time period where you were growing up pretty much okay in the 90s what is what uh like clarice's car obviously no one has any smartphones Mm -hmm. 93 the internet was barely even known to small corners of of the world what kind of stuff do they do on the set in regards to props cars do they really go all out to bring the 90s back Yeah, I I think they do a really good job. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be folks that really nitpick and find something, but I I can't see it. (laughs) I'm really not catching anything. Um, I think certainly in terms of our costume department and wardrobe, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, What they've found to tie in both the film and the time period and the prints that were at like the most prevalent at the time, the computers that are in the offices and the software and things that are popping up. Like you can see it on our Clarice CBS Instagram, like all the weird little like file bubbles that pop up. I'm like, whoa, I remember that. I remember my gateway 2000. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) In the last episode, uh, uh, I forgot who it was, pulled out their drawing and had this big old uh, uh, beeper sending machine. Yeah. I'm like, oh my god! Does it give yeah, you? Yeah, they all have they all have pagers. I love it. Being from a generation, the let's call it the internet generation, have you sure. gained any kind of respect uh, for old timers like myself, who my teens and late twenty, early twenties were in the nineties, and we did not have internet. We did, you know, we still the CD having a CD in your car was like the in thing. If you had a car with a CD player, you were rocking. Now, you were on uh, it. I mean, to move past the cassette tape, like, yeah, you're killing it. But let me tell you this. Um, uh, I mean, does it give you an appreciation for that? It does. My siblings are a lot older than me, so I feel like I got to enjoy that stuff a little bit more than the average born in the 90s kid. Yeah. Um. So luckily, I hope that I didn't take those things too much for granted, given that my siblings showed me the right way of life. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But 
Yeah, my my brother definitely had records, thank goodness. So I have that appreciation, which I know everybody's getting back into full Vinyl. full on now. Yep. Um, a good old floppy disk. I still remember saving oh, school files on floppy disks. Incredible. Uh, I'm, am I dating myself badly now? No, uh, um, no. Yeah, but I, I definitely have an appreciation for it. And I wish that in a lot of ways we weren't dealing with the cell phone life. Um, oh, God. There are some ways that, of course, it's hugely beneficial. But in others, I'm like, I could do without. Let me tell you what. I got my first internet-ready computer. I begged my mom to get it for me in 95. Four days yeah. later... Four days later, on this service called America Online, I met a girl, mm. and that girl is now my wife of 21 years. Oh, my god! Four days on being into the internet. I just met this girl, and I messaged her. and That's amazing. We dated for four years and been happily married for 21. <laughs> and, wow. And I okay, go to people. Internet. Yeah, I go to people, yeah, you know that whole, uh, you know, online dating apps like eHarmony and them? I'm like, me and my wife, we pioneered that stuff before there, yeah, were you did. before there were dating sites and any of that stuff. I love the 90s. I really do. That's I, awesome. <laughs> I grew That's up in the 90s. That's such a cool story. Uh, I mean, you are amazing as Catherine. Rebecca Breeds. I cannot see anybody else besides uh, Jodie Forster, uh, and I was really skeptical on how I was going mm. to receive Clarice, but sure. Rebecca nails it. I mean, there's no That's other way That's awesome. To say it. I'm so glad you feel that way. Rebecca yeah, I think so too. nailed it, and the chemistry between Rebecca and Michael Cudlitz is electrifying. Mm. They yeah. they play each other. They play off each other so well. Your relationship, mm-hmm. what I'm really looking forward to, I think your destiny, your character's destiny on Clarice and Clarice herself is you guys are destined, your fates are to be together in some way or another. They're going, your, your paths, even though she's trying so desperately right now to avoid any memory of Buffalo Bill, which means yeah. avoiding Catherine, it's... Right. She can only avoid it for so long. And I'm really looking forward to I know you can't spill any secrets, but I think there's going to be explosive Yeah, scenes. all I'm going to say is keep watching. We'll, we'll, we'll give you something to watch. Absolutely. It's going to be explosive. When I can't wait for that moment, hopefully this season, where you and Clarice come face to face again. That is going to be something to watch. And I can't hmm. wait for that. Uh, Marnie, you've been amazing. This hour has just flown by. Is Aww, there, thanks. Is there anything, any last thoughts that you want to share? I don't know. Just fight for our show, guys. We, don't we have, love you. Uh, We're only here because of our audience, so we hope we uh, we bring it home for you. you. You guys bring it home every week, and I talk about the show at least several times a week. Everybody that I know who's watched it has fallen in love with it. Uh, in fact, we have awesome. a, we have a team here, and one of our researchers, you know, when we were getting ready for your uh, uh, appearance here tonight, was only mm-hmm. going to watch your scenes and get a gauge. She ended up mm-hmm. binge watching all four episodes. She couldn't stop watching. Ah, it. that's so great! <laughs> yes, you've been that. you are. Uh, shining star we look forward to seeing you on clarice we look forward to watching you in your career beyond clarice you have a bright future ahead of you thank you so much for being here with us and just sharing a little bit of what it's like to step into this iconic uh story this iconic role and you know you have an amazing cast you have an amazing writing team and it's just going to be great i just can't wait to see the rest of it and me too thank you you. so much guys thank you so much for tuning in tonight uh marty thank you so much again for being here till next time guys stay safe and on behalf of marty and myself stay walking Mm -hmm. good night